Sir Roger Penrose, a Brit to be sure, uh, he says consciousness is the result of quantum gravity. I disagree. I say quantum gravity is the result of consciousness. It is actually consciousness that collapses wave functions into solid matter. And uh, I think this is what Sir Roger Penrose's office looks like. <laughs> the Department of Entropy. But that's just from a Scots point of view. <laughs> Time, this paradox that we look at in the future, starting with source point, the potential of all potentialities extends for eternity. We speak to our teenagers when they listen, and we tell them that they have the whole world laying at their feet. They can be anything they want to be. All they got to do is choose. Of course, we've kicked ourselves out of that equation. Now our life's already done. There's nothing we can do. But your life, it's just laying before you. You can be anything you want to be. The potential of all potentialities. But in reality, if you look at this denominator, this is a pi times the diameter squared times the height of the cone divided by 12. The denominator changes. What happens is that radius, the result of that cone begins to change and it becomes parabolic. In fact, we get all kinds of undulations in that potential of all potentialities. How do we do that? Well, we do that by pushing our own future threads into that cone. We decide how the universe is going to unfold and deliver us what we want, what we dream about. Unfortunately, like those other universes that might be based on some other element, it doesn't resonate. There's no mathematical probability for that to occur. So if you want to accomplish a dream, you've got to leave the probability at its maximum. Access to time by human observation is very possible. Like in the movie uh, Next with Nicolas Cage. In the very beginning of the movie, he's narrating it and he says, basically I can look two minutes and 20 seconds into the future. But the future changes just because you looked at it. Ha! <laughs> it does. A very strange thing happens. It changes structure. It changes motion. Considering a condition in time is observing it. And when we observe it, we change the function. We change the probability. Observing it has a change upon it. There can be a change in entropy toward order. How does that happen if you have a universe in explosion? Well, you can take a segment of it and you can observe it and you can change it. This is what I think time lays out like. From left to right, we have the past. You'll notice it's not just a little straight line with no dimension to it. It's kind of a thin tube, which means we have some latitude with what we can do with the past inside of reason. I mean, we can't really replace that finger we lost. I, I didn't actually lose finger, but we also can't uncrash the car. We can't unburn the house, but we can change how it affects us. We can change how we move forward with that reality. So here we are in the present. You'll notice going forward too, the cone isn't that great wide potential of all potentialities. It's somewhat truncated. That's because of the choices we've already made. That's because of your choice not to go to college or your choice to marry this person or take that job or buy that car. All of those choices affect your immediate future. But out beyond that, it's pretty much the potential of all potentialities. The trick is to shorten that front cone and try to open it all the way up. How do we do that? How does that work? We go to the past and we look at things, we can change them, which changes the present as well. I use this slide because it reminds me of a story of two people sitting outside in a cafe having a, a small meal, and all of a sudden, in the street beside of them, two cars have an accident. 
neither one of the drivers are hurt, but they're piling out of the car, and both the drivers have a different version of what's going on. The policeman shows up to write his police report, gets their stories, looks over at the sidewalk, and sees the two people having this small meal, and asks, did you see what happened? Well, yeah, I mean, we were sitting right here. So he gets their reports as well. Now how many versions of the crash does he have? Four. Just about that time, the restaurant owner comes out and says, hey, I have a surveillance camera that overlooks this area. We could go watch the tape and see actually what happened. So the policeman says, that's an excellent idea. So the six of them go into the observation room, the store owner plays the tape back, and everybody gets to view the event objectively, just the way it unfolded. And the one driver says, boy, you're right, I, I crossed the line when I dropped my lipstick in my coffee. <laughs> and the other guy says, no, no, it was my fault for not reacting quick enough. I was reading the paper. But they both get to clear that, and they get to move beyond that. And both insurance companies are made happy. So let's just run a little experiment here, just a little time travel, just, just for my amusement, and yours maybe. Let's close our eyes just for a moment. Just take a deep breath and just relax. I want you to go back to the home you lived in when you were eight years old. From the outside, just look at the house from the street. Look at the front yard. Look at the toys that might be laying there, a bicycle perhaps, or a car parked in. Look at the color of the house. What kind of plants might have been growing there? Whether the lawn was cut. And then you go to the front door and knock on the door and your eight-year-old self opens the door. You invite yourself in. And invite yourself back to your bedroom and look at your favorite toys, models or dolls, games, whatever it is you played with when you were eight years old. And now it's time to go to the supper table and you sit down and you're having a meal with your family and your eight-year-old self, but only your eight-year-old self can see you. And that's finished. You, your eight-year-old self takes you back to the front door, opens it up. You step out onto the front porch. Turn around and face your eight-year-old self. You get to tell yourself one thing. You decide right now what that thing is. Now come back and open your eyes. Some of you felt that. Some of you felt the information that you gave to your eight-year-old self and brought it forward. A shudder, a shiver, some kind of realization. Like back to the future. That's as simple as time travel is. So when you look at this potential of all potentialities, it's kind of a fog. It's kind of not really understandable. And this is where it started to gel. This is where it really started to make sense. If we're in this potential of all potentialities, why is it that we block the universe every time we ask for something like, uh, well, what do you really dream of? What do you want out of life?